I've known Ray since before we were in high school, uh, which would be grammar school. And we, in high school, we, most of the kids in Rutherford County went to Central High School. And Ray and I, a group of others, were in a polite, studious group of kids uh, that I kind of refer to as nerds. Uh, <laughs> first year, and at the end of the freshman year of high school, you could, the girls could try out to be cheerleader. Well, we were thrilled, and I have to say, maybe a little surprised, Ray was selected to be a cheerleader. Wow. So then she immediately was catapulted into a higher group of athletic, popular kids. <laughs> she was always nice to those of us in the nerd group, and she managed <laughs> she managed to, to maneuver and travel between both groups with lots of grace and kindness. And so we're all very thrilled to watch her as she, uh, well, I would have to say she has continued to, uh, to do these diverse and interesting things that she does, um, both on the planet and off. <laughs> so she'll tell you about all that tonight. So please let us welcome Dr. Ray Sitt. I feel like I've known Dewey all my life and we have uh, so many connections along the way that's been fun. I have to tell you how intimidated I am to speak to you all tonight <laughs> because you know so much more of the history of Murfreesboro than I do. Um, and so, you know, when I was first kind of on the speaking tur uh, circuit, someone told me that when you get up to speak, you must first prove your credibility. And the only way I can really prove my credibility uh, to this group, perhaps, is to talk a little bit at first about my pedigree because <laughs> I come from some good folks probably related to a lot of you in, in uh, distant ways but I'd like to talk just a little bit about them first to let you know where I've come from all right so Peter Ransom we know about 1650 was in the House of Burgesses. So that goes back about as far as I know about the Ransom family. His great-grandson, Richard Ransom, fought in the Revolutionary War. I am much um, appreciative for him because that allowed me to be a member of the DAR who mapped out my genealogy for me. So all the dates and all the names that you'll see pretty much came from the DAR genealogy map. So I'm very indebted to uh, Richard Ransom. His great-great-grandson was William A. Ransom Sr. Now he uh, came from Murfreesboro, or at least from Tennessee. So we're getting just a little bit closer to uh, where I have lived, and um, so I feel a little bit more of a connection to him. And then I want to introduce, this is W.A. Ransom Sr., his children, William A. Ransom Jr. and Lucy Ransom Ray. Now Lucy was W.A. Jr.'s sister, not his wife, but his sister, and you can tell that she married Will Ray. I want you to remember those people because um, they um, actually play an important role when I speak a little bit later on. Well, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit, and I would bet that just about everybody in the room will know this next fellow. Right? Oh, man. Greg Tucker knows who that is. Where's Greg? He looks like our liberator. Absolutely. Broken horse the courthouse. Yes. This is Nathan Bedford Forrest. Right? That's uh, No, but he is connected. So, you know, that's part of a pedigree too. Not blood related, but connected, and I'll tell you how. Through this event, 
My great great grandfather, Major Charles Anderson, is seated right here. He was Nathan Bedford Forrest's aide de camp. That kind of happened by accident. Charles Anderson lived in the community of Florence near here, had a sort of farm, a plantation, whatever, wanted to stay out of the war, the war, the war, as we say around here, <laughs> uh, the war of northern aggression. Um, anyway, he was determined to stay out of the war. He was a quartermaster in the railroad. So he came home from a trip one time to find that his house had been burned down that the pictures of his ancestors had been cut out of their frames and nailed to trees around the property. Interestingly enough, we know it was a slave owner because his little oral history said they ran all the slaves off. So that made him mad, as you can understand. Luckily, his family was gone and no one in his immediate family was hurt. But he decided he was gonna sign up for the Confederate Army rode off, heard Nathan Bedford Forrest was nearby. So he went to Forrest's camp and said he'd like to join up. Well, he met General Forrest and, uh, and he said, General Forrest said, well, you know, what do you do? And he said, well, I was a quartermaster, uh, went, went to college, went to school, and Forrest said, can you take a letter? And my great, -great grandfather said, sure sat down, transcribed what General Forrest said. Turned out to be three pages long. And <clears throat> Charles Anderson said, that's great, I've got it all, but could I summarize it just a little bit? And Forrest said, okay. So he got it down to one page. So Forrest said, I'd like for you to be my aide de camp, which to me sort of meant his secretary, his, his writer person. Well, come to find out, there's in this book, talking about all of the escapades of that uh, escort and staff, as they called it, Major Anderson was really leading troops. He lined up the artillery, he moved people into position, he was there, and I know he was at the Battle of Stones River. I have a long um, oral history from him that someone wrote down, probably it's over at MTSU, I'm not sure where it is, but I have a copy of it, and he outlines all the battles that he was in, and what he did, and where he was, and what he did after the war. Well, he came back to Murfreesboro after the war, and um, apparently made a good bit of money, uh, believe it or not, was a fairly wealthy man. So, we take the next step in the genealogy, W.A. Ransom married Clayton Anderson Ransom, son of Major Charles Anderson. So that's the connection to my family, really, in very many ways. But W.A. Ransom was a pretty well-off sort of fellow, and so was Major Anderson. When they married, I'd like to, I have a copy, believe it or not, torn out of a newspaper. They were married January 1st, 1889. Believe it or not, I have an old newspaper torn out, raggedy edges, and it talks about the lovely wedding that W.A. Ransom Jr. and Clayton Anderson had. The end of it says, the groom is a young man of sterling worth and <coughs> splendid goodness capacity, while the fair bride is one of the most popular and lovely young ladies of Rutherford County. The news, which was the newspaper, I guess, back then, extends to the happy couple its best wishes for a life of wedded bliss uninterrupted to the end. And I think if uh, this was uh, in our day, you might call them the it couple of 1889. So that uh, is in my history and begins kind of uh, the history of, of people that I know uh, Clayton Anderson Ransom lived into her 90s, and I knew her as Aunt Clayton. You remember when I told you that um, uh, W.A. Ransom and Lucy Ransom Ray were brother and sister, 
Lucy Ransom Ray died at age 30, probably of childbirth. She had had five children by then. And Lucy went to live uh, with these people, not Lucy, but um, one of her children, Margaret, went to live with this couple because they were childless. So again, the story widens just a little bit, but was very interesting to me because I always called, uh, I never knew W.A. Ransom Jr. He died before I was born. But Clayton was Aunt Clayton to me, and so I had to figure out how she was my great-great-grandmother, or my great-grandmother, but we called her Aunt Clayton. So anyway, that's that history. So it gets a little bit closer to me. Margaret Ray Dane, for whom I am named. I am Margaret Ray Seddon. I knew her well, called her Mammy. She was my grandmother. She married Lester Winfield Dan. I believe the Dans were from Lebanon. Um, anyway, Greg can probably tell me that later on. Uh, but the Dan heritage is very important to one of my children. My younger son is named Edward Dan Gibson. Now, it's very important to him to know about this historical event in the family, that he's related to the Dans because that means because the Dans came over to the United States in the early 1800s from Ireland. So my son can legitimately celebrate St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> so I'm hoping he has the luck of the Irish. So we do have a little bit of Irish blood. So, you know, you'll see that uh, many of the names change from generation to generation because there were so many daughters uh, in, the, in my line of, of inheritance. So the names change. I'm going to introduce a new name that you may recognize. Uh -huh. This is Edward Seddon, handsome devil that he was. <laughs> he wasn't from around here. He was a Yankee. He lived in Columbus, Ohio and went to Ohio State University. Now, lo and behold, a beautiful Southern Belle from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, happened to just at the same time be at Ohio State University. How in the world did she go from Murfreesboro to Columbus, Ohio for school? Well, she went to Stevens College in Missouri her freshman year. It was an all-girls school. Now, my mother was very popular in high school. She didn't like being in an all-girls school. So she came home after her freshman year and begged to go somewhere else. She had an aunt who lived in Columbus, her father's sister. So they let her go to Columbus, Ohio, to Ohio State. That's where my mother and father met. So when OSU plays a football game, I'm never quite sure who to cheer for, uh, but I'm attached to Ohio State University. So, my father that you saw in uniform uh, fought in the war, World War II. Uh, he was smart enough when he got to college in 1938 to realize there was probably going to be a war in Europe, signed up for the ROTC. So when, the, when he graduated, he became part of the heavy artillery. He liked to say that he landed uh, at D plus 60, D-Day plus 60 days with the big guns, which was probably a safer place to be than on the Omaha beach on D-Day. He survived the war. My mother uh, helped put him through or went with him through law school. So he came back to Murfreesboro to really help with the little old ladies, my mother's mother and grandmother. All the men were gone by then. So he came home to help with the family, which is a whole other story, believe it or not, being a Yankee Catholic, Harvard-educated lawyer in Murfreesboro, Tennessee was not easy. Anyway, they flourished. This is a nice picture of my mother and father, me, my little sister. Um, you know, pretty idyllic sort of upbringing um, in the 1950s. So, now we get to Ray. And Maybe if I have 
shown this picture to some of you prior, you might know where Ray is. This is the kindergarten at First Methodist um, uh, Church. I'm a kindergartner. I think the kids on the first row were pre-K. The rest of us are kindergartners. And you would probably, if I told you where to look, would, would know some of these people. My best friend Susan Garrison, Dr. Garrison's daughter, is there. Uh, I think one of the Ransom boys is there. I think some of the, uh, Linda Mason is there, for those of you who know her. Uh, if, if some of you know these other people, I would love to uh, have them identified. Can you pick out Ray? She is always the runt of the litter. <laughs> right there. This is Susan Garrison. She is one year older than me. She started school because she was an October birthday. It was a November birthday, and I, they didn't start me until I was uh, uh, a little older. So here I am in kindergarten, a little kid. But again, um, a wonderful place to start kindergarten. Happy memories of the First Methodist Church. Now down the street from the First Methodist Church was my grandmother's house, the Dan House, the Ransom House, and it was the College of a uh, corner of college and academy and if you'll excuse me just a second I was looking at this picture because I don't have many pictures of Murfreesboro that show that house. Greg help me here. This is Main Street. I think this is the WK Polk Hotel. Yes ma'am. Yeah. That, yeah. yes, ma yeah. That's Spring. And so right here is my great-grandmother's house on the corner of College and Academy. I believe that's it. You're across from the women's club. Across from the women's club, exactly. I love the picture. I hope somebody can give me a, a copy of it because yeah. it's there. Oh, it's there? And um, it, um, Aunt Clayton and uh, W.A. Ransom, Uncle Will, live right next door to Mama Lily and Papa Jim, sisters married brothers. It was a small town back then. So nice, uh, interesting little piece of history. Well, the house at the corner of College and Academy um, was torn down in the late 50s. Murfreesboro had grown out around it. There was a filling station next door. Um, all the old buildings were disappearing. That lot is now, I think, a parking lot for SunTrust Bank. And there's not much left uh, except memories and some furniture and things. One important thing that my father managed to save um, before the house was turned down, torn down, was a window that sat above the staircase in that house. Beautiful old house. I think Greg helped me look at it. It was bought, it was not built by W.A. Ransom. It was bought in the 90s from a fellow that went bankrupt. But it was a beautiful house. And above the staircase was a window, a stained glass window. When the house came down, my father had the foresight to, um, to save the window, put it in storage. Eventually, when the First Methodist Church built a new sanctuary, this is hung in the back of the sanctuary, for those of you who remember, uh, and I remember it being there, but then um, I decided that it was probably a good time um, maybe to get it back. In fact, I had shown a picture of my wedding at my Sunday school class, they asked me to do a little talk about my beliefs and everything. I showed a picture of my wedding, and in the background in the First Methodist Church was the window. Mm -hmm. I don't know if some of you know Barletta Dagby. Mm -hmm. uh, goes to my church in my Sunday school class, came up to me after the, my little presentation in Sunday school, and said, whatever happened to that window? I said, oh God, it. it's in storage. And she said, would you ever consider giving it back to the church? And I said, well, you know, it's not a religious window. I don't know what anybody would do with it. But then the First Methodist Church said, we got a big empty wall. Maybe we can do that. Well, the, mm -hmm. I, it makes my heart pound when I think of, in my Sunday school class, we discussed it. And I said, it's going to need some restoration. And the church said, I don't know if we can take it. It's going to cost a lot of money to in a frame and 
put it up there and backlight it and everything. It's going to cost some money. So we said, um, how much? And they told me about how much it was going to cost to, to restore it. It was in kind of bad condition after all those years in storage. And I said, I'll cover the cost of the restoration if the church can, can come up with the money. And you know, the financial guy said, well, I don't know if we have $15,000 to put it up there. Mm -hmm. Well, we told my Sunday school class we may not be able to do it because it's going to cost $15,000. And one of the rather well-to-do gentlemen in the back said, I'll start it off and I'll give $1,000. Rather than passing the plate at Sunday school for the rest of our lives, they raised $15,000 in 10 days. So it's there. If you ever care to go to First Methodist Church, the new one down, uh, down um, <coughs> north of town, it's in the narthex. And every time I go to church or Sunday school, I get to look up and see the heritage for my family. So I'm very, very proud of that. But more about me. This is where I grew up. Fifth Avenue, right near the entrance off Main Street to the university. This is where I grew up from the time I was two years old and my parents came back from Boston and bought this little house. This has to be very early because if you go there now, the house is still there. The Woodfins lived here. There were other houses being built around. It's a cul-de-sac. Uh, all um, folks coming back from the war. Wonderful folks. Probably 12 or 15 kids on the street. Um, it was just an incredibly wonderful place um, to live. And I lived there until I went off to college. So this is kind of what I think of as, as really my home. And it was, <laughs> my grandmother used to complain why did you build a house so far out of town? <laughs> it was in the suburbs. It was about a mile from the square. But it was kind of out um, in the middle of nowhere at first. In the backyard of that little house, my father said one night, Ray, I have something important to show you. It was when I was about 10 years old, October of 1957. He took me out in the backyard and showed me this, Sputnik. I think my audience is old enough that most of you remember Sputnik and how it changed so much of everything. He showed me in the sky a little light blinking across um, and said, that is the first man-made object to orbit the Earth. And tonight, right here in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, you are witnessing the beginning of a new era, the Space Age. Now, from an, for an impressionable 10-year-old, um, that is something major. I am at seeing the beginning of a new age. Well, all of you remember the excitement of those early years of, of space. And I always wondered if there would be a, some opportunity for me to go there someday. But the astronauts were all men, <laughs> test pilots, and at least five foot six inches tall. I never made it over five foot two. I wasn't going to be a man, and they wouldn't let me be a test pilot, so I threw away that idea. However, I continued with school, as most of us did. I went to St. Rose of Lima Catholic School. I started there in the first grade and was in the first graduating class. It was a tiny school back then, three classrooms, eight grades, two nuns, and I think three nuns, and um, it was a good school. I didn't know any different. We were all sort of crowded in, and um, I got a pretty good education there. Uh, people don't know, but it, it was started back in, gosh, um, 60, 50 something. Um, anyway, a long time ago, and the only reason that there were enough kids to even go there was Seward Air Force Base was nearby, and the students were bused in, the Catholic kids were bused into St. Rose. So we had enough students to have a school, three classrooms. Um, and when the base closed, the school closed. But now it's back. Many of you know that. It's a great school. I'm very proud that it is back and proud to be in the first graduating class from that school. Well, as G Delia mentioned, we all went to Central High School. It's a big step up for me from a three-room schoolhouse <laughs> to Central High School at the time. Um, but it was exciting. And as Delia mentioned, into my freshman year, I 
got to be a cheerleader. I thought it was pretty hot stuff. That was a cool thing to do back then. Got to go to all the football games and, and watch everybody, all the Tigers win all those games and basketball games and had a great time. I was a pretty good student, I have to admit, but my favorite course was biology. Now that was really odd for a girl. Uh, you know, everybody else, when we had to dissect the frog, you know, especially the girls, eh, don't want to touch it. I thought it was the most fascinating thing that I had ever seen to see the heart, the liver, and, and everything in there working. And so I, I sort of knew that I wanted to major in some sort of science when I got to college. Well, my senior year, I began to look at schools across the country and wanted to find the best one in the country in life sciences. Well, I found one, and I went there without knowing very much about it. <laughs> this place. Murfreesboro at the time probably had 15,000 people. The school had 27,000 people when I showed up. Students. So uh, it's Berkeley, University of California at Berkeley. Now, again, those of you who are old enough to remember, remember that Berkeley in the late 60s was an interesting place. <laughs> <laughs> the anti-war protests, women's lib, free love, all kinds of strange things, hippies. Um, anyway, it was a great school. Um, I learned a lot, even in the academic part. <laughs> but yes, I was part of the protests, but I wasn't protesting the war itself. I just wanted them to bring all the boys home. I knew some guys that were over there, and I really didn't want more of them to be killed in the war. I just wanted the war to be over and for them to come home. And I'm kind of glad that um, maybe I had some effect because there were men over there who were um, fighting in that war. These are some of those boys. The F-14 jet, for those of you who don't know it. Flown by my husband. So he was over there fighting the war while I was here protesting it. Anyway, didn't know him then, but he did come home safely. Um, so my next step after I graduated from Berkeley was medical school. I went to medical school at the University of Tennessee in Memphis. Um, they didn't admit very many women. Uh, back in the day, Pat Sanders probably knows, they, um, they admitted um, fewer than 10% of the medical school classes uh, were women. So they just really didn't think women should take up a spot. In fact, uh, some of you may remember um, uh, um, the pediatrician, Charlie Lewis. He was our pediatrician and at the end of uh, college, I happened to date his son, we were over there talking, and he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to go to medical school. And he said, no, you're too cute to go to medical school. <laughs> I sent him an invitation to my medical school graduation. <laughs> so, maybe the women's live movement had some effect, but when I went to medical school, they decided they would admit uh, more women than they ever had before at the UT in Memphis. In a class of 100, they admitted six of us. That was good enough for me. They were going to give me a chance. Um, and uh, oddly enough, I was, uh, as a child, very good at sewing, so I decided I'd become a surgeon. And I was uh, the first woman, only woman, that they admitted to the surgery residency program. Um, but that worked. And um, I was planning to be, you know, a rich plastic surgeon when I got a little bit older. And then towards the end of my surgery training, I found out, rather serendipitously, that NASA, in 1977, uh, was planning to take uh, applicants for a new space shuttle class. It would be the first class of space shuttle astronauts because the shuttle was about to come online. And they were, for the first time, going to take non-pilots and open the applications to women. Now, I didn't really believe that they were going to take women the advertisement was out there. I sent in an application, crossed my fingers, and in 1978, became one of the first six women astronauts. Again, the runt of the litter, but <laughs> tall enough. I met the height requirement by two inches. Uh, in any effect, um, I think that there were many people who didn't believe that women were suitable for space flight. 
but they gave us a chance. They put us through all the testing that the men went through to see how we would do. Uh, one of the first things that we had to learn how to do, besides taking classes in all the sciences and engineering and everything about the shuttle, we had to learn how to be good flight crew members. One of the best ways to do that was to fly in the NASA T-38 jets. Believe it or not, I had my private pilot's license when I was in Memphis, about 100 hours of Cessna 150 time, and here I am plop plopped in the back seat of a jet. And the pilots let us learn how to do the flying, handle all the instruments in the back seat, and um, you had to find someone that you enjoyed flying with because the pilots in our group uh, were going to teach us how to fly. And so I found one that was really good. He's seated in the front of the airplane. You can't see him very much, but he was a very patient teacher, um, a wonderful person, very smart. He was an F-14 pilot, and so I married him. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good move. He's still my husband today, so it worked out. Did you get a good grade? <laughs> yeah, fast. <laughs> but I did learn how to fly those airplanes. They wouldn't let us do the takeoffs and landings, but boy, they were fun to fly. NASA was a little surprised when all of a sudden um, we announced we were going to get married. Uh, they had never had married astronauts before, two mar astronauts marrying each other. It's kind of like, but there weren't any rules against fraternization or anything, so we got married. A lot of press about it. But again, it was a bit of a surprise. And even more of a surprise a year later when we produced the world's first AstroTot. <laughs> if you're wondering, an AstroTot is a child born to two astronauts. It is a very exclusive club, probably a dozen or so in the world. We were not the only astronauts that married each other and had children. So um, this is son Paul, first son. and. Um, he is very proud that he can say it's the world's first astro top. It impresses the girls a lot. <laughs> In any event, Hood and I began to be assigned to our space shuttle flights. My first flight was a rather routine one. It was the in the pre-Challenger era, we launched a couple of satellites that became the paying customers for that flight. We did some other things on the flight, some um, engineering tests, some a few science experiments. We took some toys up and did a video uh, for kids about the physics of weightlessness. So it was, uh, it was a pretty interesting flight. We ended up having to try to rescue a, an errant satellite, so that added some time and some complexity to the mission. But you know, on your first shuttle flight, there's so much to learn just about living in space. Weightlessness is something that we cannot simulate well here on the ground. There is no place where you can go where they turn off gravity. There is a, a plane that flies like a roller coaster, and you get 30 seconds of weightlessness at the top of each hill. Um, it does that about 60 times, and that's why it's called the Vomit Comet. But uh, it didn't really simulate weightlessness. So your first flight is where you get used to working in space. My second flight was after Challenger, and it became one of the, the kinds of missions that we um, often did after Challenger when we became a research and development rather than a trucking company. Uh, this is my second crew. This is STS-40. Space Transportation System 40, the way they numbered it. Um, it was a dedicated life sciences flight, the first time they had ever dedicated a flight entirely to the life sciences. One of the interesting things you'll note about this picture, there are three women on the crew. First time three women had flown um, on a flight together, so everybody was a little worried about that, but that was kind of silly at that point. Mm -hmm. And of course we had to go through a lot of training, about two years of training, to run all of the experiments that were proposed from all over the world. Not my research, other people's research. And so we had to be both subject and operator for all those experiments. It was hard training, um, a lot of work to do. We spent a lot of time working together, but we did have some fun. <laughs> this is that same crew. This is our informal crew picture. You won't find it in the NASA archives, but we are pretending to be a MASH unit, the STS-40 MASH unit. For those of you who remember the MASH movie and, and TV shows, you recognize uh, Father Houlihan, um, the, uh, with a name like Ray, I of course became Radar. Uh, <laughs> the surgeons, hot lips, Houlihan in the back. And of course, one of the guys had to volunteer to be Clinger the cross-dresser. <laughs> Needless to say, none of them volunteered. They drew straws and 
Dr. Drew Gaffney, an eminent cardiologist now at Vanderbilt, was clear. Uh -huh. He does not like it when I show this picture. <laughs> but we did have fun. We were a good crew. As you can imagine, there's a lot of teamwork involved in, in, um, in all the shuttle flights, not only with the people that were flying, but the people who put the thing together, who launched it, who monitored for mission control. It was an incredibly wonderful group of people to work with. Anyway, we launched in June of 1991 on this flight. Uh, the most asked question is, how did it feel to lift off? Um, it was pretty amazing. Uh, you really felt like you, uh, the, play, the thing had exploded. Four and a half million pounds of explosives and they light the fuse. It's a kick in the seat of the pants. Uh, not too many Gs until you get close to orbit, up to three Gs, but that's not bad. Eight and a half minutes after you launch, you're in space. The engine's cut off, you unbuckle yourself, and you are in space, and you are weightless. Everything floats. It's pretty uh, amazing um, to be there. Uh, it's always nice to have survived the launch. <laughs> this is Space Lab, which we carried on that mission. It's like a big bus, the size of a big bus, 15 feet wide, 23 feet long, uh, inside of which is all of the scientific equipment. Uh, it sounds like it's pretty big. It felt like, uh, you know, when we train in the simulator later on the ground that there was plenty of room. But when you pull out all of the equipment and you begin all the work, uh, usually four people back in the lab, it can get pretty crowded. As you can see, all of the equipment back there, there are four people, and the one you see in the back is a dummy. Yeah. That is Recessa Annie, for those of you who had taken, have taken uh, CPR classes. We tried to do some CPR in space just to see if we could do it. Anyway, there were four uh, scientists on the mission. As you can see, two men and two women. Uh, we were looking at the human adaptation to weightlessness. We wanted to know how to keep people healthy for longer periods of time. So we had to do some testing. Uh, this was the first time that they had tested both men and women at the same time. And we proved that women and men adapt to weightlessness the same way. So you should have mixed crews in the future. Now, one of, um, one of the folks at, at uh, Greg Tucker's class this morning uh, knew that I was gonna be here tonight. Uh, Ron Nall asked me, you are gonna show some pictures of the Earth, aren't you? And I did, I said, oh, yes, of course. I have my two favorites. I guess because this is a Bible story and a picture. This is looking out the window one morning. Snap this shot. I'll give you some geography here and some history and some biblical history. This is the Nile River, the Nile Delta. Old Pharaoh lived over there and ruled the country of Europe. His daughter fished a baby out of the bulrushes. His name was Moses. And you can understand why Moses and the Israelites maybe wandered around for 40 years because that's the big Sinai Desert, the desert of the Sinai Peninsula. And eventually, made their way to this little green patch over here, clinging to the coastline of the Mediterranean. That's Israel, where Jesus walked. So it's a, it's, a, it's a Bible story, all in one picture. Made me remember all those Bible stories my grandmother read me. Um, again, we went around the earth every 90 minutes, if you can believe that. Uh, and we had 45 minutes of daylight, 45 minutes at night. And you would think that, well, you know, we could sort of relax and eat supper on the dark side of Earth, but we didn't, because we could see stuff like that. Geography lesson, the boot of Italy. It's like Ooh, a high heel yeah. boot. Mm -hmm. And you can pick out Rome and Venice and Florence and Naples and Sicily's the island off the toe of the boat, boot. But just incredible to see where all the people live and to, and to think about the history that's involved in this place. You can also see where the people don't live uh, over in the Balkans. Uh, and if you get a picture of uh, Korea, nowadays they take them, and you can tell the difference between North and South Korea. South Korea has plenty of lights, like Italy. North Korea has almost none at night. So it's the difference, um, not only the, between the, you know, the North and the South, but uh, the people that live there. Anyway, uh, I made flights in, of length uh, seven, nine, and 14 days. It was always glad, I was always glad to be able to come home, see the family, do 
this is Dan the Irishman. This is Mama in Columbia coming home from space. So a nice picture snapped by my husband at Edwards Air Force Base um, of the shuttle landing. This is the end of our shuttle time. This is my husband after his fifth flight. You can see daughter Julie, who I inherited when I married Hoot. This is Paul. This is little Dan. This is Emily. This was a challenge. She's two weeks old. So mom looks a little tired because she had to go to the Cape with the baby in tow. But uh, it all worked out just fine. Um, she's 23 now just graduated from college. So they've all grown up quite well. We're very proud of them. Hood and I were uh, on eight flights all together. He made five, I made three, but I had three babies. So it all even now. <laughs> <laughs> we sort of feel like we, um, we were there in the heyday of the shuttle program. Um, the shuttle program was 30 years. Um, we were there for 20. So um, we loved every minute of it. Um, when they began building uh, the space station, uh, we decided, you know, I was not a construction worker uh, and there wasn't much flying to do uh, besides the, the docking. And so we came back to Murfreesboro to raise our family. I'd like to tell you just a couple of things about what I did after I came back from, um, from space. I um, worked at Vanderbilt for nine years uh, as the assistant chief medical officer. Found out that I had learned a lot about teamwork at NASA and began to teach teamwork and patient safety to the healthcare workers at Vanderbilt. Uh, they were very receptive to that. We began to decrease the errors that harm patients. And because it was such a successful program at Vanderbilt, we formed a company, a couple of pilots and a couple of us doctors, called Life Wings that now teaches that um, to healthcare uh, institutions all over the United States. So I'm very proud of that. I don't do any of the day-to-day -day, um, operations of that company. I'm still on the board. I'm still active in, in advising the company, but have really walked away uh, from healthcare. And um, I sort of felt like after that, I kind of retired. I was tired of traveling. So I needed a project. This is the shuttle era. This is my project. I have books back there. This was published in 2015. Uh, it is a story of our years, Hoots and my years at NASA. Um, it was a very interesting time. First women, uh, first people to marry each other. Um, many things, Challenger accident was in there. Uh, but we felt like we ought to put that together into a story and write it down. It was a challenge to write it, but I'm proud that it's here and I like to share it with people. So if you would like a copy, we have some over here. Probably some of you had yours for a while and have read it, but I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I think we might have a little time, just a little time for questions. If you have any questions for me about the space program, about Med Ransom, can you tell us, is it Med Ransom, your, your ancestors? Oh yes, they're all my, my ancestors. Because Med Ransom, I see. Oh, Medicus. Uh, yes, okay. Medicus was, um, I think, in the generation of W.A. Ransom Sr., but he's buried at the, at the cemetery. Mm -hmm. There's a, a Ransom plot out there mm -hmm. with a lot of my relatives there mm -hmm. um, from way back. Rebecca Ransom Jones, Ransom yes. Jones' mother. Absolutely, Ransom Jones' Lady. mother. Again, we're, we're um, kin to lots and lots of people here, yeah. so I may be related to you somewhere back along the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the well, whites. Well, got a ransom in that. Absolutely. And my husband does. I mean, I've seen a, the med ransom. I mean, I didn't know it was Medicus. It's oh, Medicus. It's it's me. Doctor. I don't know why yeah, he, yeah. he got that name, but he was a doctor. In Rutherford County. In Rutherford County. So there are plenty of ransoms, a few mm -hmm. rays around. Um, but um, anyway, not too many settings, but a few of us. Yes, in the back. Do you know where Major Anderson's buried? Where he what? Where he's buried. I don't know where Major Anderson is buried. Do you? I think he's at Evergreen. Probably so. If I go looking around. Um, out there. Um, it's kind of hard to find people back in there. It's not. Well, he's, he's close to Burn Cross, the last surviving uh, uh, better soldier. 
Um, I'm not sure about that. I know he lived a long life and died in probably 1904, mm. something like that, according to the genealogy. Uh, again, he, he lived uh, to a ripe old age, um, time enough to tell the story. <coughs> I'll go over there and look. Thanks for the hint. Yes, another question. Where is your husband from? <laughs> My husband is from all over. His father um, was a pilot, but he also ran managed airports. Uh, eventually, at age 50, went back to college, got an engineering degree, and began to be a test pilot for the Federal Avi uh, Aviation Administration, FAA. So he tested all kinds of airplanes. Um, that's how my husband really got interested in, in, um, in aviation. It was hero worship of his dad. So um, Hoot was born in Cooperstown, New York, uh, moved all over the place, lived in Virginia, uh, lived in a number of different places, and um, lived most of his life in Southern California. So when we left NASA, we had the uh, decision to make whether to go to Southern California or Murfreesboro, and uh, we couldn't have afforded a house in Southern California. <laughs> and Murfreesboro was a better place to raise kids. We used to come back and visit folks around here. I have to say that Delia Goodman's sons, who were so polite um, to everyone, he decided that's how we wanted our kids to be. So thank you, Delia, and thank you uh, to the boys. I have one. Here. Well, now I understand that uh, on one of your flights that you took a particular garment that represented a basketball league from right here in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. <laughs> the All Men's League. Yes, I took one of their caps. NASA let us fly a few a few things for charitable organizations uh, or schools um, that we cared about, and uh, the, the basketball team asked if they could fly a hat. Now, I had to portray them as a charitable organization to NASA, but the hat did fly. I believe y'all still have it. We gave money. Oh, yes, we still got it. Lou's got it. He's got the patch. Your patch right. on his My jacket. My patch is on the jacket. Hey, everybody's got, uh, that knew me back then. Dr. Seddon was our team physician, and our patron saint was Buster Pugh. <laughs> they had a really good time. How we passed that off, I don't know. I also took a, uh, I asked the, um, the town if they'd like me to take up something. And they gave me a roll, a long roll of paper that was signed by all the school children in Murfreesboro. So I felt like they all went with me. Uh, had a wonderful time coming back to Murfreesboro after my first flight and going to Central and having a, a big celebration. Ray, I was uh, uh, entertained by the fact that yeah. <clears throat> Hoot was on the program of not being smarter than a fifth grader. Oh, don't mention that to my husband. <laughs> that was great. I about that. My husband was on, are you smarter than a fifth grader who was raising money for NASA scholarships? And all dog. He got right down to that last question, was just sure, because it was a math question, he was an engineer. He got it wrong. <laughs> so please don't mention it to him. He, he says it's the most embarrassing moment of his life. <laughs> yes, um, how do you get the nickname Hoot? The name Hoot. Hoot. Uh, when you join the Navy, his, he was always known as Bob. Uh, when you get to the Navy, you have to have a call sign, like Maverick, Iceman. Um, <laughs> and the squadron leader said, uh, so what's your name? He said, it's Bob. He said, that's not very distinctive. You have to have a, a different name. We'll call you Hoot. Well, Hoot Gibson was uh, an old movie star, cowboy. So a lot of Gibsons get that nickname, so he became Hoot. It always uh, bothered me uh, after he and I married. I would get a phone call and they would say, is Bob there? I never knew it was Bob. <laughs> so I would say, no, he must have the wrong number. Of that was his family call. <laughs> I can't speak for y'all, but I'm fixing to get a check and buy myself a copy of the book here in just a minute. Um, our next speaker, which will be held on uh, Monday, October 15th, Dr. Talbert, would you care to say anything to that? Um, Greg, I think. Oh, is it Greg? Where's Greg? Who is it from the uh, Women's Club? Yeah, I've invited a representative from the Women's Club to give us a little history and then also to tell us about uh, their project. 
uh, trying to save the basket home there, which uh, has some needs. Thank you. And also, one of the things I love to give shout outs to people, these chairs do not get placed by themselves. Thank you, Russell, for all the work that you do. <laughs> so with that, is there anything else I'm forgetting to bring up? With that, we stand adjourned. Buy a copy of a book, folks. How much are they? Yeah. Probably more than I can.